is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And, or literally the idea is even, this is what was lacking, even ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Here's the qualifications. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the servant of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast to the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, here's his duties, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lookers' sake. We'll stop there. Let's ask for God's blessing.
particularly with regard to the oversight of the preaching of the word. Um, tonight, the topic is going to be specific, really rather introductory, the broader responsibility of the elders over the minister in general. In the coming weeks, it will be that work of the over the over the minister concerning the preaching of the gospel. Uh, we have here, bringing the word of God to us, Professor Keminger. All of you know him well enough. He graduated from our seminary a whopping 35 years ago, last fall, and has been in the ministry for that long. He served four congregations, first in Hall for five years, then in Loveland, Colorado for nine, then in Southwest for 11 years, and then at Faith for a few months. <laughs> and then he received and accepted the call and it was God's will that he labor in the seminary. And he will be completing his 10th year. Now, I, now I think he was, uh, he got, he begged us to let him teach even that first year. But he uh, will be a Thank you very much, Reverend Van Overloop, for your kind words and introduction. <clears throat> 35 years, you're talking about retiring me, retiring the present staff at the seminary. It seems like yesterday that I was ordained into the ministry. It's hard to believe that it's coming to a close. We'll not think about that, though, tonight or for a while. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know that there are some other things going on that are preventing some from coming to this first meeting, a uh, consistory dinner, for example. Uh, but I'm grateful for your coming out tonight. I want to thank the Grace Consistory for organizing this Office Bears Conference and for inviting me to speak at it. I'm hoping that we will learn together tonight and in the coming weeks, that we'll have an enjoyable time together around God's Word. I'm hoping that the elders will come to a better understanding of their calling, particularly a better understanding of their calling as it relates to the supervision of the work and life of the minister of the gospel, and especially his most important calling, the calling to preach the gospel. I'm hoping that the fruit will be that our churches and our ministers will profit as a result of the elders conscientiously carrying out their calling to supervise the preaching of the ministers. The three presentations that I plan to make are really an expansion and a development of a single speech that I gave last fall at the Office Bears Conference for Classes West. Some of you may have attended that conference. The focus of that speech and the focus then of these presentations is going to be very narrow, specifically on the calling of the elders to supervise the preaching of their minister. Many elders have questions about this calling, what this calling entails. They wonder about how they ought to carry out the calling, at least how best to implement practically the calling that they have. Often they have questions about putting into place some regular type of review of the minister's preaching at which the elders and the minister together have opportunity to discuss the preaching and the elders given the opportunity 
to offer to the minister constructive, that is, helpful criticism of the preaching, including especially suggestions for improvement. We'll hope to be able to address some of those questions and those concerns and more that you may have as we go along. Uh, I want to emphasize that you may stop me at any time. If you have a question on a particular point that I'm making, don't hesitate to interrupt. I hope that we have a kind of classroom atmosphere here and that we can have some give and take that way. That being said, we're always going to have opportunity after the presentation to ask and answer questions. And I don't anticipate to be able to answer all your questions. I don't want to always be the one answering. I want to hear from you what you may think about someone's question, what approach you have taken, or the answer that you might give to it so that we can pool our resources here and really discuss some of these issues together. I want to take our time at getting to the main subject of this conference. I know that many of you are most interested in that matter of the supervision of the preaching. We will get to that, I promise. And hopefully, I will give all the time that you want and all the time that we need thoroughly to discuss that matter. Take the time to answer all the questions. But I want to get there slowly and deliberately. And I want to take the time tonight especially to lay the groundwork. We are not going to discuss tonight the supervision of the preaching. We're not going to. I want to hold that off for next week and week number three. I want tonight to lay down some important principles that we must keep in mind as we discuss this matter of the elders' supervision of the preaching, some important principles that come into play as the elders carry out this calling. I want to begin tonight with the general calling that the elders have to supervise the life and the work of their minister. Having established that calling, then to go on to establish the specific calling, the narrow calling of the elders to supervise the minister's preaching. And that will be our next session. And then at our final session, I want to consider how practically to implement the elders' supervision of their minister's preaching, including at that last meeting some suggestions for the format of meetings at which the preaching is discussed, some basic questions that the elders ought to face together. I emphasize that together and officially at these meetings, questions that need to be asked and need to be answered. And I will also look with you at that time, that last meeting, at a document that Professor Gritters and I have drawn up, a document that can be used, can be used. There are alternatives, there are other possibilities, other options, but a document that can be used by elders as they implement their calling 
to supervise the minister's preaching, a document that Professor Gritters and I have put together and that we have entitled A Suggested Elder's Guide for Evaluating Sermons. Let's turn then to the subject of the night, the elder's supervision of the life and the work of their minister. I want to begin, and all of you hopefully have this outline, right? You can fill in a few notes as you please in between the main points and the sub-points in the outline, but this is how we'll proceed then tonight. I want to begin by establishing with you the calling itself, to establish with you the calling that the elders have to supervise the life and the work of their minister. One of the fundamental principles of Reformed Church polity is the parity of office bearers. The parity of office bearers. The parity of office bearers is the equality of office bearers. The equality of the office bearers. We're going to turn the overhead off after I've used it because of the difficulty in taping the uh, videotaping with that light on. The parity of office bearers refers to their equality. This is a distinguishing characteristic of reformed church government or reformed church polity. Fundamental to all hierarchical systems of church government is their repudiation of that principle, the principle of the parity of office bearers. Reformed church government distinguishes itself from every form of hierarchy in this important principle. The most extreme form of hierarchical church government that you are familiar with undoubtedly is the government of the Roman Catholic Church. The government of the Roman Catholic Church is hierarchical, expressly, explicitly, boldly hierarchical. The Romish Church is ruled from the top down. At the head of the Roman Catholic Church is, of course, the Pope. Beneath him, the cardinals. Beneath them, the archbishops and bishops. Then the local priests, deacons, and the laity, who really do not make up the church, do not belong to the institute of the church, according to Rome. Another overhead on the hierarchical Roman Catholic system of church government, the Pope, who is the Bishop of Rome, so that there is not only a supremacy of an office bearer, historically, in the Roman Catholic Church, but the supremacy of a church as well. One particular church over all other churches, the Church of Rome. The Cardinals, 193 worldwide. The Archbishops, who serve over 
a number of dioceses, the bishops who preside over a single diocese made up of a number of local parishes, the priests who generally serve in one parish, the boundaries of the parishes will vary, usually according to numbers, numbers of people, and the deacons who assist the local priests in the celebration of the mass and the laity or the people. The hierarchical system of church government, the head of the church on earth, the one office bearer who is over all other office bearers is the Pope, the present Pope, who is the first Jesuit to become a Pope, is Francis. In principle, all the other office bearers in the Roman Catholic Church are subject to the one office bearer who is the Pope. Technically, all other office bearers in the church are under his supervision. He rules supreme over the church visible in the world and over every local congregation. The reformers rejected hierarchy. They repudiated not only the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church of their day, but the system of church government that protected and defended and promoted those false doctrines, as is always the case. Hierarchy. Hierarchy in the church always stands in the service of the defense and the protection of heresy and heretics, invariably. And that was the case at the time of the Reformation. The Reformers repudiated Romish hierarchy. They rejected the teaching that the church has one visible head. And they maintained that the head of the visible church is the invisible, resurrected, exalted, reigning Lord Jesus Christ with appeal to Colossians 1, verse 18. And he, that is Jesus Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In 1 Peter 2, verse 25, Christ is called the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Christ is the bishop in the church. Christ is the office bearer in the New Testament church. Christ alone rules over the church. Beneath Jesus Christ, earthly office bearers now are of equal authority. The Reformed churches rejected hierarchy and they confessed instead the parity of office bearers. The Reformers rejected hierarchy and confessed 
the parity of office bearers in what was the very first article, article number one of the old Dutch church orders. It is now nearly the last article in our church order. Article 84 of the 86 articles in our present church order. But that article used to be the very first article. Article 84 of our church order reads like this. No church shall in any way lord it over other churches, like the Church of Rome over all other churches. No minister over other ministers. No elder or deacon over other elders or deacons. That article has often in the past been referred to as the anti-hierarchical article. The convent of Basel what is regarded by some as the very first Dutch Reformed Synod. Technically, it was not a synod. That's why it's often referred to as the convent or the convention of Wezel. W-E-Z-E-L, by the way. It was not, strictly speaking, a representative synod with office bearers that were delegated to this assembly by all the local churches. Instead, ministers and elders, ministers especially, who were able attended this meeting, this very first meeting of the Dutch Reformed Church leaders. They drafted a kind of church order, at least a document with various chapters and articles that laid down the fundamental principles of Reformed Church government. Thereafter, the Dutch Reformed Synods that met and that made and drafted the church orders leading up to the Synod of Dort, which drafted basically our church order, they all really go back to the original work that the convent of Basel did. In chapter four of article in chapter four, article seven, the delegates at Vasel warned the elders that they, quote, not lay claim to any authority nor to any liberty to lord it over the ministers of the word, nor over the church. And in chapter 4, article 9, the convent warned that the elders, quote, ought to be fully aware of the fact that it in no way pertains to their office to establish rules or to exercise authority, be it over the ministers of the word, over their fellow office bearers, or over the church as they please. In other words, their rule is not absolute and is not arbitrary, but the elders too are subject to the word of God. Chapter 8, Article 14, warns the ministers against, quote, seeking to lord it over the church or over their colleagues, end quote. And Article 15 of that same chapter mentions the sins that call for reprimand 
and censure in the ministers, among which sins is listed, quote, striving to command and to lord it over the church and over their colleagues. The parity or equality of office bearers that we're talking about tonight, and that is fundamental to the work of the office bearers, the parity or equality of office bearers has two important aspects to it. These two important aspects. There is first parity among office bearers holding different offices. Parity of offices, really. That is, equality among the ministers in relationship to the elders and to the deacons. Equality among the elders in relationship to the ministers and to the deacons. Equality among the deacons in relationship to the ministers and the elders. One office is not above the other offices. One office does not have authority uniquely to it over the other offices. But there is equality among the offices. That is, office bearers laboring in their own sphere, have authority in that sphere. The deacons, an authority unique to them in the collection and distribution of the alms. The elders, an authority unique to them in the matter of the supervision of the church and the discipline of the members. And the minister, in authority, unique to him, in proclaiming the gospel and dispensing the sacraments. The work that belongs to each of those offices is peculiar to those offices the elders ruling, the ministers preaching, the deacons collecting and distributing the alms. No one office has an absolute authority over the other offices. The second aspect of the parity of office bearers is the equality among the office bearers themselves within the same office. No minister is over the other ministers, whether in the classes or if there is more than one minister in a particular congregation. No elder is over his fellow elders, and no deacon is supreme or of greater authority over his fellow deacons. The ministers are of equal authority. The elders are of equal authority authority, and the deacons are of equal authority. The practical manifestation of this 
latter aspect of parity of office bearers shows itself in what and where? Where does this aspect of the parity of office bearers show itself clearly? Speak to me, somebody. Daughter assembly? Even before that, Thomas. Okay. Yes. In the local gatherings of the office bearers. In the consistory meetings. In the council meetings. And in the deacons meetings. Every elder gets how many votes, Tom? That's it. One vote. And hopefully, one elder doesn't monopolize the discussion either, but because of the nature of those discussions, all the office bearers feel free and do actively contribute. Every deacon, one vote. And the ministers, one vote. And then, What's true at the local level applies also at the broader assemblies. Exactly. One man, one vote. And that's the practical expression of the parity of office bearers. Now, that does not rule out young men that does not rule out deference shown to those who are older, wiser, and more experienced than you. They are. The older ministers are not just older, but wiser and more experienced than the younger. They've been around the block. The older elders who are not serving their first or second term, they are experienced. They know the goings-on of the church. And the younger elders ought to learn from their fellow older elders. And the same thing applies to the deacon. Primus inter pares. First, or chief, among equals. That's the deference that the younger office bearer, who is wise, pays to the older, more experienced office bearer. He listens. That means to the counsel. He seeks the counsel of the older ministers, elders, deacons. But the bottom line is that there is parity, there is equality among the office bearers in the reformed system of church government. The Reformers and our Dutch Reformed forebearers fought tenaciously for this principle of the parity of office bearers over against hierarchy. Closely related to the parity of office bearers, they fought for the important principle of the autonomy of the local congregation, which in a way is the application of this same principle, but now to congregations. Each congregation is self-governing. And really, this matter of the autonomy of the local congregation is only the other side of the coin of the, autonom uh, of the parity of office bearers. Whenever the autonomy of the local congregation 
is violated. Whenever its right to govern itself is taken away, and men or assemblies usurp the prerogatives of the local office bearers. When that happens, invariably, the parity of office bearers is denied on a practical level. Then the rule is taken away from the local office bearers. Their right to rule in their own congregation among the people that elected them. And then they are ruled over by others outside of the local congregation. But, and this is a big but, but this parity of office bearers does not preclude, does not rule out, supervision, any and all supervision by the elders. It does not preclude the rule of the body of elders in the local congregation. To be sure, it rules out parity of office bearers, rules out rule by one man or by a very few. Our form for ordination of elders and deacons speaks of this. It speaks of the government of the church being placed in the hands of a number of men to the end, the form says, that thereby all tyranny and lording may be kept out of the church of God, which may sooner creep in when the government is placed in the hands of one alone or of a very few. But parity of office bearers does not preclude rule by a plurality of elders in the local congregation. Rule by elders chosen by the congregation from within the congregation herself. Neither does the parity of office bearers preclude the supervision of the minister by the body of local elders. No one elder has the right to usurp authority over the minister not actually, nor practically, but the elders together, the elders as a body, are called by Christ to supervise the life and the work of their minister. The elders may not usurp the duties of the minister, the duties that are unique to his office, to be sure. That would be preaching and administration of the sacraments. There's a reason, a principal reason, why traditionally the Reformed insisted on reading sermons. Kind of a thing of the past, I know, because of the advances in technology today. Now we can have videos, we can have live streaming of services, but the other option early on was reading sermons, not elders making their own sermons, as is the case in some traditions. Reason? This is a duty that is peculiar, that is unique to the office of the ministry. But, 
without usurping the duties of the office of the minister, the elders may and the elders must supervise the minister's carrying out of those duties. You see the difference, I think. I don't need to belabor the point. Now I want to demonstrate that this indeed is the calling of the elders, that it is their calling to supervise the life and work of the minister. Uh, that the elders have this calling, Roman numeral three at the top of the back side now, that the elders have this calling is evident from our church order, Article 23, which describes the calling that is peculiar to the elders. Many of you have this green book. Article 23 reads, The office of the elders, in addition to what was said in Article, 3, uh, Article 16, to be their duty in common with the minister of the word, their duty is to take heed that the ministers, together with their fellow elders and the deacons, faithfully discharge their office. That article, as we have it in our church order, originated in the Dutch Synod of The Hague in 1586. Article 23 goes all the way back to 1586 and is almost exactly the article that was adopted in the church order of the Synod of The Hague. The first thing that Article 23 mentions as the office that is peculiar to the elders is to take heed to the ministers. In commenting on this article of the church order, Vendelin and Monsma state in their church order commentary, quote, the elders should give particular heed to the ministers of the gospel. It is of prime importance that these preach and teach correctly and effectively and that their labors are performed in all faithfulness. We'll have opportunity next week to come back again to that quotation. There are some significant elements in that quotation, but now just to note that generally Vendelin and Monsma take the position that Article 23 calls for the elders to take heed to the ministers, that is to supervise the ministers. Professor Hanko, in his notes on the church order, commenting on this same article, says this, the minister is also under the supervision of the elders. He too is subject to their rule. This is true as far as his personal life is concerned. He is not above the consistory in any way. His doctrine and conversation are subject to the scrutiny of the consistory. W. W. J., those three initials, Van Una, O. E. N. E., in his commentary on the church order entitled With Common Consent, it's a very worthwhile commentary, if you are able to get it, uh, Van Una is Canadian Reformed. In connection with this article, he says this, quote, We also mention, as belonging to the specific duties of the office of elder, that they have supervision of their fellow office bearers. What they in particular should pay attention to is the purity of doctrine and the sanctity of conduct of the ministers of the word. 
page 107. And Van Rungen and Deddens, in their commentary on the church order, in connection with the same article, call for the elders, quote, to supervise the minister's doctrine and conduct. J.L. Shaver, in the first volume of his two-volume work, The Polity of the Churches, states this, quote, In Presbyterial polity, the consistory or session exercises a greater control over the minister than is exercised by any group within independent or episcopal congregations, but this control lays upon the eldership of presbyterially governed churches the solemn obligation to use it judiciously. Page 163. That it is the calling of the elders to supervise the life and the doctrine of the minister is also plain from the form of ordination of elders and deacons. You hear that form read every year. And undoubtedly, you're struck by some of the things that are in that form, perhaps things you've heard several times before, but for the first time, it strikes you, the importance of something that's read. The form begins by discussing the institution of the office of elder and then proceeds to the office of elders, that is, the duties of their office. The form identifies these main duties to be three, three main duties. First, according to the form, general oversight over the members of the congregation, the work of Christian discipline. Secondly, it is their calling to see to it that all things are done decently and in order amongst Christians. That is, everything that happens in the congregation, everything of an official nature and the life of the church generally is characterized by decency and good order. And then third, third, quote, it is also their duty, particularly to have regard unto the doctrine and conversation of the ministers of the word, to the end that all things may be directed to the edification of the church, and that no strange doctrine be taught. The calling of the elders to supervise the life and the work of the minister is also plain from the questions that are asked at the time of the annual church visitation. Those questions, too, are included in this green book that contains the church order. Page 133 in this most recent edition, page 117, in the previous edition. Six questions, six questions are put to the elders and deacons in the absence of the minister. The minister is out of the room. The church visitors ask these six questions of the elders and deacons. Ordinarily, the vice president of the consistory answers the questions on behalf of the consistory, although if anyone has anything to add, opportunity is usually given for them to join in. These questions focus on the calling of the minister, and we're going to see next time on his preaching, on his preaching. But they also include more broadly his life, and his work. 
Among these questions, the very first question asks, does the minister do his work faithfully according to the word of God, the forms of unity, and the church order? Is he a hard worker? Does he work diligently? And is he governed in his work, what he produces within the congregation by God's word, the confessions, and the church order? The fourth question that's asked is this question. Does the minister reveal himself as a worthy example? A very, very important question. The fifth question is, is the minister devoted as much as possible to the exercise of his office? Does he give himself to the work? Is this his life? Is he consumed with all the aspects of the ministry? So much for the questions for church visitation. The calling of the elders to supervise the minister is also implied in the reformed practice of censurum morum, as prescribed by our church order, Article 81. That term, censurum morum, is a Latin expression. It really refers to the censure of morals or conduct. Article 81 reads like this, The ministers of the word, elders and deacons, shall before the celebration of the Lord's Supper exercise Christian censure among themselves, and in a friendly spirit admonish one another with regard to the discharge of their office. The article calls for mutual supervision, mutual supervision among the office bearers, minister, elders, and deacons alike. That implies, included in that, is the calling of the elders specifically to supervise their minister, the minister's discharge of his office. That's implied, and that really is a principle upon which the mutual supervision of the office bearers rests. The fact that the elders, along with the deacons, compose the trios from which ministers are called, actually issue the call, sign the call letter that all implies their right and their responsibility to supervise the work of the minister. This calling of the elders to supervise the life and work of the minister is grounded in Scripture. I'm actually going to end there tonight. I'm going to give that to you as a homework assignment. We'll begin there next time. And let's say for the first 10 minutes, I want to hear from you what you believe to be the biblical proof, the biblical grounding for the calling of the elders to supervise the life and the work of the minister. Don't focus on the preaching. There's solid biblical evidence for that, but be broader. I want from you the biblical support for the elder supervision of the minister 
generally? What would you appeal to in Scripture as proof that that belongs to the calling of elders? All right? Do some thinking about that and come up with some lines of biblical argumentation to support that. And then I'll give you what I've got, and maybe you can add to that for next time. Reverend Van Overloop, I'm not sure what you had in mind for the question period. Do you want to MC that? Do you want me to MC that? What did you have in mind? Go ahead. All right. <laughs> kind of figured that. No. No, it didn't. All right. We've agreed, or I've agreed at least, that we're not going to focus, we're not really going to talk about the preaching tonight, the calling to supervise the preaching, but the calling more broadly. Any comments, any questions, concerns, add to what I've said, disagree, feel free to disagree with what I've said. Anyone? Yes, Sid. I just have a question. I guess I'd like to get your take and maybe the other men. But that question for that church that would say may be devoted as much as possible to exercising the office. I imagine there can be varying opinions on that. Um, yeah, what, what standard or how do you make that determination? If I quoted that right, I'm not sure I got that all right. But. Mm-hmm. That's the fifth question, uh, the organization of the questions. If you have your green book, it's on page 135. Uh, the format of the questions for church visitation are the largest number of questions, the first 19 questions to the full council, elders, deacons, and minister. And usually when there's a serving pastor, the congregation isn't vacant. He takes the lead in answering those questions. Then he's excused, and there are the six questions that are put to the elders and deacons in his absence. And the fifth one is the question that Sid is concerned with. How are we to understand that question? What's it asking? Is he devoted as much as possible to the exercise of his office. Anyone? We're going to have to hear from Reverend Van Overloop on this one because he's asked the question many times as a church visitor. Let's first hear from you. You've had the question asked of you in consistory. What do you understand? That question to be focusing on Somebody. Otherwise, it's just like in class, I call on somebody. <laughs> yes, Michael. Is he devoted to his call? Is he diligent in his work? Does he sacrifice for the congregation? Very interesting, by the way, to pay attention to the adjectives that are used in almost every one of these questions. <clears throat> faithfully is the outstanding one. Faithfully, faithfully, faithfully. In this case, diligently is what Mike is saying devoted implies. Is he diligent in carrying out the duties of his office? Agree? Disagree? Something in addition to that? I saw somebody. Yes. I think, uh, I think that for the elders to answer that question uh, while the church visitors are there and to bring things up 
that really haven't been thought and discussed, <coughs> thought about and discussed uh, beforehand uh, is probably not fair to the pastor. So uh, I think quite often during church, when church visitors are there, the, uh, the council in answering the questions maybe are not as direct as they could be because they feel maybe that they haven't finished their work before. So maybe the first question needs to be, have the elders been uh, faithfully discharging their office during the year so that something can be um, brought, brought uh, forward uh, if, it needed, if it needed to be. And I also think that the church visitors, as uh, difficult as their work might be, uh, could possibly probe just a little bit more as they're asking those questions and uh, put a little meat around it because uh, sometimes I, I feel that uh, we maybe don't have a good idea what they're driving at or how broad of a question uh, it might be as far as its detail. That's the word, the very word that I was going to use too, Harlow, probe. I think there are a couple of points to be made. I want to hear from, uh, there were one or two that, that wanted to say something. Don't let me forget you. Uh, but just a couple of things in connection with Harlow's remarks. Number one, I agree that if something is going to be brought at church visitation, that's my view of it anyway, if something of a serious nature is going to be brought up by the elders at church visitation. It needs to be brought up by the elders, not by an elder. And it needs to be agreed upon by the elders ahead of time that they're going to bring this up, albeit through their vice president or through a senior elder, but that they have talked about this and that they have agreed that they need to bring this up. On the other hand, church visitors can tell they've been around the block, the older, the wiser of the ministers. They know from reports that they've heard they may have their own children in a congregation whose consistory they are visiting. They know some things. They've heard some things, perhaps. But they can probe and they can get out of the elders even if they're not officially, unitedly bringing a matter that they have decided upon beforehand concerns. Concerns that one or more of the elders may have, or at least find out if it isn't just one man, but two or three or more who share this concern. So I think both are true. Some probing, but certainly if something of a serious nature is going to be brought, an elder ought not to spring that on his fellow elders at church visitation, but should have raised this with the elders earlier. But I saw another hand somewhere, for sure. Yes, go ahead, Greg. I think that's a nice observation, Greg. The word implies love. Devotion is love. And exactly what you say, does it come through in how he does his work? That he loves the church on behalf of whom he's working, loves the church, doesn't view what he's doing as work, even though it's hard work, doesn't view it merely as a duty, but is his delight, is his vocation, his calling, does he do it cheerfully? Is he doing this because he wants to do this work out of love for the church and love for Christ? Somebody else? Ron? Ron? Conference, and one of the biggest questions was, how do 
can carry out or implement the supervision. And, and I guess my specific question is if you see a minister that is not <coughs> totally <coughs> devoted to his work each, uh, you, you, you know the minister is not up to snuff or up to par, what, what exactly do the elders do? I mean, do, how do you do this step by step? What's, what's the step? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk very specifically about the preaching, what to do if there are deficiencies in the preaching. That's going to be our main focus, how to address those deficiencies. But what about in this area? What about in the general supervision of the minister? Deficiencies in this matter of devotion, if there are matters of his life, that although not sins, he's not walking in open sin, are nevertheless of a concern. What about work that is left undone or isn't done in the way in which it ought to be done? How are we going to address those things? How is the consistory going to handle those things? What is it an elder going to do initially I would assume you first talk with the minister. I would assume. Mm -hmm. Before you bring it in front of the whole elder, the consistory. That would be the general rule. The general rule for a general concern. Talk to the minister. There may be something that he says that he's able to disclose to you that may shed light on the concern that you've had, something that you've noticed different about him in the last six months or whatever. Who knows what it may be? All kinds of possibilities come into my mind. But before you would raise it in consistory, the best advice is go to talk to the man. Sit down with him in his study. Or go out for lunch, I suppose. Sit down with him in his study is probably the best. And open it up with him. Talk to him about it. Raise the concern that you have. Agree, disagree, and what's the next step? What would you do next? What, what kind of help are you thinking of, Ed, in particular? you have anything in mind? I have nothing in mind because it would have to, be, it would have to address whatever problem you see. Mm-hmm. But if he's not doing the work, then it's not going to be done. Mm -hmm. You have to ask him if he needs help in that work. Maybe he's not enough time. In Hudsonville, it might be because it's such a big congregation. Overload? Yeah, Exactly. Does he need help in the sense of assistance in doing the work? And certainly there are other possibilities too as far as help is concerned. Especially in the greater Grand Rapids area or possibly even in the Northwest Iowa area where there are fellow office bearers, other ministers that he can turn to that he can get help from, counsel from, or whatever. That is something to consider. Anything else? Go ahead. Uh, to add to the, what we just talked about, is it right, or how often, the work of the pastor should they regularly should it be on the agenda I guess is what I'm, I'm saying and then do is it ever right to discuss a public
apart from the pastor so that the pastor knows <clears throat> that the pastor doesn't see possibly that there's disagreement among the brethren so that if there was something that was, were to be brought up, he could see that the elders are together on that. <coughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. What would you say, Leon, as far as the frequency with which these things are addressed, the regularity with which the elders face squarely the matter of the minister's walk, work, and then the preaching? What do you do in Granville? A broad smile. <laughs> what do you do? We don't regularly? Not regularly, no. I'm going to promote next time the idea that the consistories do this at least twice a year. That elders twice a year discuss the work. I'm particularly concerned with the work. Life, too, but I'm particularly concerned with his work and then especially his chief calling, the preaching. I'm going to promote the idea that twice a year the consistory takes the time to discuss that very thing, that it's on the agenda or that there is a separate evening set aside for it. I'm actually going to promote the latter, although I know that we're all meeting out. So maybe that's not practical. That's not feasible. But still, twice a year. Mike. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the other thing that Leon raised there. I'm going to say this, and then you react. You can agree, you can absolutely disagree. Ordinarily, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that ordinarily it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary if relationships are right between the minister and his consistory. I think that they can be open and frank with each other. And although in that kind of a setting, in the general sort of discussion of the work and the preaching, there isn't a united decision of the elders, nevertheless, in the course of an open discussion, the minister comes to see what is the mind of his elders. He ought to be able to read them and to gather from the discussion what their viewpoint is and learn from it, take it away from the meeting. If things are right, Things can come up, criticisms, valid criticisms. The minister can see that there is general agreement among his elders. That's something he has to take to heart and take home from the meeting. But it may come to it. Things escalate. There isn't change, adjustment improvement, maybe things deteriorate even, it may come to it that the elders meet apart from the minister so that they can have an even franker discussion, they can come to a consensus and then together bring that to the minister. That may happen, and that's up to the judgment 
of the elders, in my view. They have that right. But that would be, under extreme circumstances, and even then, it must be an official meeting of the elders. There must be minutes. That meeting must go down in the record. It must have a beginning and end like any of the other meetings. It mustn't be a couple of elders meeting secretly. Uh, a couple of elders regularly discussing the preaching. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not saying there isn't any room for elders to confer unofficially, but ordinarily this ought to be done in the official meetings and you ought to do it together as a body of elders. All of the elders taking part in this discussion and in this evaluation of whatever aspect of the minister's work his preaching or anything else. That's, that would be my suggestion. Now those are generalities that doesn't fit every situation. There are all kinds of circumstances that may alter that. But that's generally what I would say. Dennis. Robert's rules don't govern consistory or council meetings. Most councils and consistories have their own rules. And they will ordinarily say that Robert's rules, when they apply, are followed. But we mustn't think that Robert's rules of order are designed to fit the reformed system of church government. They're not. They're not specifically. The elders call a meeting and most, most of the uh, regulations and guidelines that are adopted by councils and consistories uh, will call for something like uh, two elders and the vice president, something like that. So that's not just a man that can summon the body together, but that it's two or three. And among the two or three, one of the officers, the vice president in particular, or the president, who may call for a special meeting. That special meeting may also uh, be set up at the time of the regular meeting, right? There may be the regular council meeting or the regular consistory meeting at which it becomes plain that a special meeting would be necessary and would be preferred in order to discuss or continue discussing the matter that was raised at the regular meeting. Yes, Sid? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry that I took that for granted. The body may never meet without the knowledge of any of its members, and that includes the minister. There may be times when the consistory decides to meet in the absence of the minister, but he knows, he must be informed that they are meeting. And why? they are meeting. And of course, sometimes that may be with the church visitors in order to gain their help and their advice in a particular situation. Anyone else yet? We're going to try to wrap it up here soon. Nine o'clock. I've got two hands. First of all, go ahead, Henry.
It's not a good general policy, but it is an exceptional circumstance, an exceptional circumstance. And that is particularly when he is the focus of the meeting. Follow up on that. They met secretly, too. That's an altogether different situation. Yep, quite a different situation. Certainly, secret meetings of the office bearers are not permitted. Uh, certainly, uh, meetings at which things take place that are entirely illegal, that's what happened there. A consistory both suspended and deposed its minister, which right no consistory has. Uh, and, and there were other things that uh, can be said about those meetings of the office bearers in Hamilton, apart from and specifically uh, behind the back of their minister. But this, these kinds of meetings are not like that. We want to distinguish the two sharply. I saw another hand. Brad. Ralph, I know of one congregation in Class West that has a special committee. Called, I think it's called the Pastoral Support Committee. It's from the consistory made up of, I think, just two elders. <clears throat> You know, I know the uh, congregation to which you are referring. Uh, I think that I think that there is. Uh, it may be the pulpit committee, not just pulpit supply, but pulpit committee uh, that does meet from time to time with the minister. So far as I know, it's exceptional. Not that it wouldn't be a good idea, but so far as I know, there are only a couple of congregations that have such committees. Reverend Bernardo, can you help me out here? Do you know of others besides the one that I know of? I, I believe uh, Faith does that. Yeah, my former congregation did. Yeah. That really happened after I was there when they got ministers right out of seminary and were concerned especially about overloading them. That's the historical origin of that committee. They didn't care about me. I was experienced. You can do all the work. That's why I quit after six months. No, no that's not true. But there's plenty of people there who haven't forgiven me yet for that. Uh, It wasn't. Redlands has a standing committee. I don't know if they still do, frankly, did. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about the nature of the work of that committee, just in a couple of minutes. Uh, they met regularly with the minister? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tom. I can't address that, Prof, but I did have this question. Yeah, early on in your uh, speech, you said no one office has absolute authority over another office. Maybe you'd explain that for me. Let us say that in a council, there's a decision made by the deacon or the <clears throat> minister in the office of the ministry that, that can, the elders do not approve of. Do they have the absolute authority to make a decision Um, to be truthful, there is some difference about that. As much as I want to maintain that not only is there mutual supervision in a consistory, but that the elders are entrusted by God 
with the calling to supervise their fellow office bearers themselves and their own number and the other office bearers. It is a question, nevertheless, whether they can force the diaconate to reverse a decision that the deacons by majority vote have taken. It's a little bit different question when we're talking about the minister. Uh, that's a little bit different issue. But when a majority of the deacons have taken a position, they voted on something, passed it, uh, for one thing, I don't think that there are very many consistories that generally review the decisions of the diaconate. They're reported what the, con uh, what the diaconate did by the elder who was present at the meetings. And by the way, that presence of the elder at deacon's meetings indicates the supervision that the elders have over the office of deacon as well as the office of the minister. But... Uh, we must preserve, I'm jealous to preserve the unique authority that each office has. The minister to preach without being handcuffed, to administer the sacraments, the deacons to collect and distribute the alms. They have the authority in that sphere and the elders in the exercise of Christian discipline. I don't want to violate the calling of the elders to supervise their fellow office bearers, but I do want to be jealous at the same time to preserve the work that is unique to each office. Tom? But just to push that a little bit, though, if, and I can appreciate what you're saying, and I think that's true, that when an elder visits with the deacons, he has to let them do the work and let them make the decision. But if they made a decision and a member of the congregation brought an appeal or protest or mm -hmm. concern to the council, the elders wouldn't say, well, uh, we have no nope. say over that. I, that's, that. And wouldn't they say that we'll, we'll take responsibility for that? Yeah, that is a little bit different matter. When there is an official protest, that's a different matter. Where there's an official protest against the preaching or an official protest, let us say, because the deacons... Uh, gave money to some organization that is not ecclesiastical, uh, whatever, okay? There's a protest over that. Absolutely. That belongs to the supervision of the elders. I agree totally. Yes, Bill. Just a, just a bit of experience. Years, years ago when I was in the first church in the diaconate, <clears throat> Before we had the church visitors, we had it set aside a little bit of time so that all we went through all the questions that we were going to ask, be asked. So we had time to talk about it. So they weren't just okay. We're having the church visitors now. Somebody's got to answer the question. I think that was very beneficial for us just to just to go through that. These are the questions. I agree. Everyone uh, yeah. Has, I agree with that, Bill. I think that there ought to be some preparation for church visitation. And the best preparation is that everyone goes through the questions so that at the meeting before the church visitors come, if anyone has something in those first 19 questions or whatever, a concern, whatever, the consistory can face it before the church visitors come. I wonder how many consistories... Councils do that, Reverend Manolo, prepare for the coming of the church visitors. I have the impression that brings Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, we better get you home to your wives so I don't get chewed out and they don't let you come next week. I hope to see you next week. Thank you.
that we in this generation can stand on the solid basis of what the church has done in the past, led by the Spirit, the Spirit that has taught men to work together, to come to a good, reformed polity. We thank you for that. We thank you that we've been raised within it and can grow to appreciate it more and more. May this be a way in which we remain faithful, a way in which we're not cut off in our generations. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for Professor Kamiga and the presentation that you should give out of thy word. Even though we might not well aware of the sinfulness that may have characterized anything that was said or done. We are aware 